were you happy that it took off? Like, what did it feel like it was about time? Did it feel inevitable? Like, when you know? Yeah, I mean, I think my main reaction to it was kind of being excited about it, right? Part of what made it magical was finding other people to connect with. And the more and more people who were there, the more people you had to connect with, the more interesting pages they were to visit, the more stuff that was online. I mean, you know, you would search for stuff and the vast majority of the time nothing would come back because there were only a handful of people writing stuff for the internet. And so as everybody started putting things up on the internet, as every company had a web page, you know, you could suddenly, instead of, I remember it used to be so annoying, you would open up the phone book and find a store and dial the store's number and ask them, you know, how late are you open? And now you could just type in their domain name, right? And there would be their hours and location and their menu, and it would all be there. You wouldn't have to, you know, at your fingertips, you wouldn't have to talk to anybody. It would just be instantly available. And I remember, you know, like just, I couldn't wait until the whole world was on the internet and I never had to call anybody again. Um, was there a moment, like a distinct moment, when you like maybe a web page showed up that had never been there before, or you searched something and you found it, where you realized how big the internet suddenly was? I think the moment where I realized the internet really had taken off was when I started seeing URLs and advertisements, right? Like HTTP colon slash slash www dot whatever dot com. It's like a really geeky phrase, right? Like, you know, I was embarrassed to write it out. And, give it to people. And you would see it on huge billboards, right? And on the sides of buses, you'd see it everywhere. And suddenly, this thing that was this kind of obscure, geeky thing that just you and your friends knew, that was just part of the culture. So what attracted you to tech and the internet in the first place? Like, I think I was attracted partly just because it was always there in my family. You know, my dad worked with computers, so we had a computer from basically when I was born, and it was just, you know, another toy to play around with, and it, you know, quickly became the most interesting toy, right? There's only so much you can build with blocks, but with computers, you could build whole worlds. And then when the internet came out, it wasn't just your world, right? You could invite other people, and you could have this culture. You know, I, I grew up in a small suburban town outside Chicago, and, you know, there weren't a lot of people on my street. It was a small street. You know, I didn't have a ton of friends growing up. And yet on the internet, you could make friends with people all over the world. You could talk about the subjects you were interested in that nobody at school, nobody that you knew cared about. But suddenly this whole subculture existed where everyone talked about it and was obsessed by it. And that's all they talked about. It was just entrancing. What does the First Amendment do in the US, just generally, like as a culturally, what, is it, what do we take for granted that it does for us? And then more specifically, like what, what, is, what do you think it should mean for the internet? So the First Amendment, right, is this classic guarantee of free speech, that however crazy your ideas are, however weird your thoughts are, even if you just want to say something you don't even believe but just think is interesting, that's protected for the most part. Whether you're going after the government, whether you're releasing documents that they have tried to keep secret, whether you're telling a reporter about, you know, malfeasance that's gone on, whether you're just making a really outrageous piece of art, the government can't stop any of that. We have the right as American citizens to have this sort of free and open communication, to share what we think, what we feel, what we've created. And I think that's a huge part of our culture, right? The sort of openness we have, the comfortableness we have with each other. A lot of that traces back to the First Amendment. And on the internet, I think the First Amendment takes on an even more important role. Because if you think about how computers work, they're not like people. They don't understand what it is they're saying, right? They just take a bunch of text from over here and paste it over there. They're just big copying machines. I mean, that's inside. That's what they do. They copy things from one place to another. And so laws about the content of speech, which traditionally have been prohibited by the First Amendment, they're almost impossible to execute on a computer, right? A computer can't look at this and say, is this offensive? You know, a computer can't look at something and say, does this upset the government? You know, it's not a person. There's just no way for it to know that. And so if you have laws saying that kind of speech is illegal, it makes it impossible for the internet to work, right? You know, every point along the system, there's something being copied. You know, the little router you have in your house copies it to a thing down the street, copies it to a big building somewhere. Like, dozens of copies are made just in the most inconsequential task. And if every time the computer has to stop and say, huh, is this illegal? The internet would fall apart. It would just be impossible to do. What kind of impact do you does that appear to have kind of on well, creativity? Yeah. So the thing about the creative process is everything is built on something else. You know, Shakespeare's stories were built on traditional legends and folktales, right? 
modern stuff is built on Shakespeare. Everything builds on something else. There's no completely new creative thing, if only because if you wrote something completely new, nobody would understand it. I mean, we all have to use words that were developed by someone else. We use ideas that were developed by someone else. Everything is this process of pulling things together and recombining them. And so what's worrying about the sort of copyright police is that they want to prevent recombination. They want to have the law come in and say recombination is illegal, right? That only, you know, you have to get a license for every single thing you use. Well, if you do that, you stifle creativity. It's almost impossible to get a license for every single thing you use. I mean, imagine if every word you used, you had to call up the person who came up with that word, or if they're dead, their descendants, and say, can I have permission to use this word? I mean, you never get through a sentence. And so similarly, we see creativity stifled, you know, songs, pull samples from all sorts of different songs. Imagine if you had to call up each person that you borrowed a, a note from, or a tune from, or a sample from, and get permission. All sorts of music would become impossible, it would become illegal. And I think that's what we're seeing in the wider culture, is that this notion that we become a permission-asking society, that every time you do something, you have to ask permission. I mean, that's, you know, the f that's basically against the freedom culture we have here. That's the opposite of a free country. The idea in America is, you know, unless it's specifically outlawed, you get to do it. The idea of copyright laws, these people want to propose it, is unless you specifically get permission, you just can't say it. What should everyone be doing to, you know, get involved? How important is it to make more noise about this, that kind of thing? People often ask me, you know, what's going to happen? And the answer is it's up to you, right? You get to decide what will happen. This isn't something playing out on a stage somewhere where big giants fight each other and you get to sit and munch popcorn. This is a fight you can join in, right? So if you go to demandprogress.org and sign up, we have actions every week. There are bills that are coming up that could crack down on internet freedom. There are companies trying to abuse their power. And it's up to all of us to stop them. We make it really easy to call your congressman, to call these companies, to write letters, to file lawsuits. All of these things that we can do as citizens are now made super easy because of the internet. And so we've got to take advantage of that to protect the internet. Great. And so just to follow that up, like personally, how, how do you feel the fight is going? It's up to you. I know, I know, but we gotta, like, you know. You know, there's sort of these two polarizing perspectives, right? Everything is great. The internet has created all this freedom and liberty, and everything's gonna be fantastic. Or everything is terrible. The internet has created all these tools for cracking down and spying and, you know, controlling what we say. And I think both are true, right? The internet has done both. And both are kind of amazing and astonishing. And which one will win out in the long run is up to us. It doesn't make sense to say, oh, one is doing better than the other. You know, they're both true. And it's up to us which ones we emphasize and which ones we take advantage of because they're both there and they're both always going to be there.